Okay, well we are in our last class of how to teach the Bible. Tonight we're going to be looking at the took. The took, the last portion of your outline, which is tying it all together. <coughs> when you talk about the took, fundamentally what you're looking at is what is it that you want the students to take away? Because you want them to take away something. You want them to take away uh, the message to be sure, but you want them to take away those principles that are drawn from the text that they can now apply in their own life. So in tonight's segment, we're going to look at the took portion of the outline. Secondly, we're going to develop how the took portion of the outline should look in your lesson. And then third, how should you present the principles of the took portion of the lesson? So those are the three things that we're going to cover tonight. <clears throat> what is the took portion? Well, it's your takeaway. It's what you want specifically the students to do. Those are things that are very simple, very simple to, uh, uh, to set forth in your teaching segment because basically you're going to give an imperative to the students, a direction. Do fill in the blank. And it's important that we always have this, that we're not just giving a data dump. Uh, the main reason for that is because for spiritual growth to occur, it presupposes knowledge of the Word, but it also presupposes that uh, there is an application portion of the Word as well. So how do you develop that? Well, <clears throat> you develop it based upon the look. Again, we talked about this last week. The look or the principles, the general principles that are extrapolated from uh, the message. And then from the look, you develop the took. That is, how do you apply or how uh, are you expecting the student to apply specifically those principles in some type of action? Uh, for example, we said this last time, just to reiterate, uh, like James 2.14, faith without works is useless. So one of the look principles that we developed out of that is that the believer should be involved in Christian service. Right? Because that's what the implication of what James says. Uh, what use is faith if there's no works? Can that faith save him, James says. And so James expects that believers are to uh, be about the task of ministering to each other's uh, needs. And one of the ways that we do that is to engage in Christian service. So engaging in Christ Christian service is a general principle drawn from that particular passage. <clears throat> a specific example of a took, that is a directive, would be this. Find somebody, take them to lunch. What better way to serve your neighbor? What better way to love your neighbor? Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that James said what use is it, my brethren, if a man says that he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? And then he goes on to give an illustration. Say a brother or sister comes to your house and uh, they're in need and yet you say to them, be warm and be filled and go about your way. Uh, is that kind of faith? I mean, what is that? That's useless. And so James gives a demonstration there of a useless type of faith by way of not meeting a brother or sister's needs. And so from that you can say, well, the guy should have fed his neighbor. The guy should have met his neighbor's needs. And so one of the things that you can do is to say, hey, find a person in class, take them out to lunch. The took uh, is a direct application in specific terms what is being taught from the lesson. So how do you present the principles of the took in your lesson? You can do it in the form of a question. You can do it in the form of an imperative, and this is normally the way that I do it. Most of the time, when, if I'm, I'm asking someone in reference to uh, believing or trusting in Christ, I'll do that in the form of a question. Uh, because you can never take it for granted that everybody that's in your audience is a Christian. And so, uh, at some point, if you have one or two or three uh, takeaways, one of those should, should involve 
uh, inviting someone to believe and trust in Christ. You can do that in by way of a question. You know, have you done that? And you can ask that. Have you done that? Have you per personally put your faith and trust in Christ? If not, I would encourage you to do that right now. So now that you begin to give them the imperative, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. <clears throat> and also be encouraging as you exhort the class. We need to remember that the took is the section of the outline that you want the students to take away. It also involves something they must do. So be encouraging when you cover this section, but make the students aware that this is the meat of their Christian walk, the living out of Christian truth. It is only by these means that one comes to know and grow in the knowledge of Christ. There is no other way. Unfortunately, biblical truth does not come to us through osmosis. So if you decide to use your Bible as a pillow at night, or you put in the audio Bible thinking, well, I'll just go to sleep and it'll subliminally come in my mind so that your mind is disconnected from absorbing the Word. All you're hearing is white noise. It takes effort. It takes effort to be a student of Scripture. It takes a greater effort to be a teacher of Scripture. And some of the things that we need to remember, not just for the class, but as you believe here and you go about uh, in the future teaching endeavors that you may have, Teach only that material that you know. Don't, te don't teach material that you think you know, that you're not very, very sure of. Uh, and then you get up and, and you find yourself sinking in front of a congregation or people. <clears throat> also, you need to remember that if you're ever invited to, to speak before a congregation in a church setting, Try to stay away from things that are considered to be controversial subjects as, as a guest teacher or preacher. In other words, don't go to uh, your, your friend who's a pastor uh, who asks you to teach and get up and give a uh, you know, teaching on uh, the merits of Calvinism or the role of women in ministry because all you're going to do is create problems for the pastor. Okay, uh, Teach something that edify spiritually but don't go into a man's house and, you know break things up and take off and leave a mess for him to clean up that'll take him several weeks to possibly months to clean up uh, after you've done hit the road so don't do that secondly wear appropriate tire attire for teaching occasions uh, close and, dr and the way one dresses says a lot about a person now, I'm of the old school. I grew up in an old school Southern Baptist home. My father was a Southern Baptist preacher. My, father, my grandfather was a Methodist minister. And uh, we grew up under the, the Brooks Law of, Mr., if you're going to go to church, you're going to be in a coat and tie, uh, period. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with the way a lot of the ministers, and, and I understand the implication of what they're trying to do, uh, be with the you know the skinny jeans and and uh, the polyester shirts and because they want to be cool or appear cool or whatever, uh, you know take out the pulpit and put a, a plexiglass uh, deal up there like a table or something so that they can drink coffee or what have you as they're talking to a congregation. Um, whatever you decide to do, I would discourage saying how you dress, try to connect with, with an audience in the sense of uh, making yourself uh, appear to be more cultural, more culturally adapt, adaptable. Um, our, our objective is to be presentable, but our primary objective is to share the Word of God and not worry about trying to look cool, uh, those types of things. I know we actually got a seminar. Steve told me never to put it on YouTube. But there's a seminar that we got at the Master Seminary on the importance and the ritual of the uniform. We don't do this much today in our American universities. They still do it some in, in England. But uh, if you look at any of the Master Seminary guys who are in the doctorate program, if you ever see any pictures of them, they're all going to be wearing a dark navy blue sports coat. 
gray slacks, black Oxford shoes, and they all have the D-men tie with a white shirt. That is the uniform. How important is it that we dress for success when we appear before a congregation that it, or a, a group that it bolsters uh, the message? It's very important. When James Montgomery Boyce uh, and R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, all met uh, in Chicago to a bunch of theologians got together and decided, okay, we're going to put together this committee and give a statement about what we believe about the importance of the Word of God. They said, well, we need someone to chair this committee. R.C. Sproul said, I knew immediately they were going to pick Jim Boyce. Why do you ask? He said, because he's dressed for the part. He was in the uniform. And sure enough, he was selected to be the chairman of the committee. So, when I say wear appropriate attire for teaching, that's that part about the uniform I got from Lawson. He seems to put, put, uh, place a great store by it. In Bible college, the professor I had there also said it was very significant to uh, always appear to be professional. He said, you cannot, men, stand before a group and talk to people about the humility of Christ if you're wearing gold rings on every finger, wearing a $500 suit with you know a necklace hanging around your neck and so on. He said, people aren't going to buy that. He said, moreover, don't wear such clothes that draws... Uh, the, <clears throat> the message away from uh, the text. He said, for example, don't show up looking like T.D. Jakes wearing a bright red suit with a yellow tie and green shoes. You know, looking like something that ought to be uh, a villain off of a Batman TV show. <clears throat> Wear something conservative, look the part, and it will help to advance the visual presentation of the message. Third, never tell an audience that you didn't have time to prepare. That's not going to be a problem in your case. You've had several weeks to prepare. But never get up in front of a congregation. And again, what I'm telling you, these are like the, 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 the nuggets that I took away from me back in 1997 when I started going back to Bible college. I, I, I've taken all my notes since that time up to the present. <clears throat> that was something that... Uh, I thought, wow, I never really thought about that, but I know I've been guilty in the past of getting up in front of people and kind of putting your hands in your pockets because you're really nervous and you start jingling your keys. And, well, uh, well, you know, they called me last night and told me I had to preach today or teach today and uh, <clears throat> uh, really didn't have time to prepare like I should. Don't tell people that. Just go, go with the flow. Uh, if you start getting off track, trust me, you'll hear about it. But don't tell people in advance. Also, never tell people in the audience that you aren't any good. Um, I actually heard somebody here, not in this group, but I, I was in a class one morning uh, during my doctoral research, and someone was asked to fill in, and I guess he got asked at the last minute. <clears throat> And he actually told us, these two nevers that I have underlined up here, never do this and never do this, he actually did both in kind of one sentence. And I thought, man, it's all downhill from here. This hour is going to be long. <laughs> and sure enough, it was. Also, be sensitive to audience responses uh, that you're teaching. Look for tail signs. Most of the time, if you start people, seeing people kind of close their eyes a little bit, or begin to wander, look at their watches, talk to their spouses or their kids in the back. That means you've lost, you're losing them or you have lost them momentarily to get them back on track. Do something. Interject a story. Uh, everybody loves stories. I can't tell you how many times I, I, I think about <clears throat> sometimes taking a camera and putting on my, my lapel uh, to show people what it's like when you're in front of a group. Because you know when you're losing them. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you say, well, you know, that reminds me once. I was And you start going down the story, and, and sure, here is everybody else. They do this. They start looking up and listening. Why? Because everybody loves stories. It doesn't even have to be something comical or amusing or whatever, but just people love stories. So that's a couple of ways that you can get their uh, attention back. <clears throat> Again, 
Be sensitive to time when you're teaching. I know here at Second, if you go past time um, habitually, and you're kind of known by that, you'll probably get a phone call from one of the pastors saying, hey, you can preach it all, brother, again, just don't preach it all in one hour. So you need to be sensitive to the time. I normally try to wrap it up three minutes before noon, like on Sunday mornings or what have you. I know sometimes it's a little bit different for the earlier classes <clears throat> because growing up in Southern Baptist churches, what time does Sunday school start? 9.45. That's a weird time, is it not? I mean, is there any other time like that where you have a time like 9.45 or something, something, 45? No. Uh, which means class probably not going to get started till about 10.10, 10, 10, 10.15 because everybody comes rolling in at 10. By the time they get their coffee and sit down and have discussed whatever it is they need to discuss, it's normally 9.25 or to 9.20 to 9.25 and then they're going to be teaching till a quarter till so they're getting about a 20 minute lesson and then have to get out. So just be aware of the time the parameters of the time wherever it is that you find yourself teaching <clears throat> also you need to be aware of your body movements and voice inflections avoid unnecess unnecessary repetition I still have to work on this quite a bit uh, one of the things that will help you is if you are able to videotape yourself and then go back and watch yourself or sometimes my wife she's really good about if I develop kind of weird habits or something that she'll tell me afterwards, hey, you really need to work on slowing down or what have you. But I've noticed the older that I've gotten, um, the more you do it, the better, obviously, that you'll, you'll get at it. But just be aware of it. Know how to use uh, the teaching format that you're in. The, the, it's either a lectern or you might be sitting at a table or what have you, uh, sitting, know how to quieten down an audience. <clears throat> we normally don't have that problem in this type of church. If, however, you were teaching in the uh, inner city, which I've taught at some of the, or preached at some of the African American churches, uh, there is a rhythmic communication going back and forth between the speaker and the congregation. And you have to know <clears throat> how those things uh, work. It took me a while. That was one of the reasons why I kind of glad I went to the Bible college I did because I learned about black preaching and the black sermon, if you will. Uh, and that at the end, you know, that's when you when the hooping starts, Doc's bringing it on home. And if you don't know what that means, see me after class. No. It means <clears throat> he's he's wrapping it up. He's coming to the crescendo of the sermon. Uh, also, you have to believe that God will take your teaching material and presentation and use it to the ministry and the edification of someone in the audience. And, and this is something that, that I've learned over the years, and I've, I've learned never to, to question this. Now, particularly if you have a medium to large size class, you have to remember that God's Word has one meaning. Um, when we talked about like in biblical interpretation and hermeneutics and so forth, there is an authorial intent to the scripture. And as a teacher, what we are supposed to do is to convey the meaning of scripture and then how it can be applied in life. But what we don't see happening are the implications of our words on the listeners. Because God is using our the message of the Bible as it is being filtered through the human instrument to minister to the needs of the people so that someone can be thinking about a circumstance where, say, a spouse and that God the Holy Spirit is opening the understanding to, to give meaning to that person so that truth is being conveyed to that person. Meanwhile, a person over on the other side of the room is thinking about something that's going on with a situation at work. And they're being encouraged by the message. Now, again, two totally different circumstances, but yet God is using the, the same words, again, as it's being filtered through the human instrument, to minister grace and knowledge 
and administer comfort to the listeners. You always have to keep that in mind because that's happening at all, the, at all times. Consider what uh, the prophet Isaiah said. So would my word be which goes forth from my mouth. <clears throat> it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. So uh, it's not saying that God has different meanings for different people. There's only one meaning. What we're talking about is how that meaning and the implications of that meaning bear out on an individual's life. And so that's <clears throat> one of the things we always have to keep in mind. Now if you look up here for a moment, <clears throat> all of this, and again, I'm not going to be able to give uh, feedback as soon as you get done, like whenever you do your teaching segment, uh, it's not going to be a time of mass feedback. What's going to happen is everybody will have a sheet of paper with all of this stuff up here on it. Um, and what they're doing is they're going to be, as, they're, as you're going through your teaching segment, again, don't think that because folks are not looking you in the eye that they're not listening next week. Um, the thing about it is it's very difficult to answer these questions as we're going through without like writing as you're talking so don't don't take that like as an insult now um, that's the, the the fastest way to get through this so the information that you get back once once you'll have your teaching segment once everybody is uh, done uh, we'll collect all of the uh, critiques and then I'll give that to you at the end of the night from everyone. So you'll have your own set that you can go through and, and things that were uh, really good, uh, things that might be improved, uh, the, your, the strong facets of your teaching presentation, uh, the weak facets of your preaching, to, preaching presentation. And the good thing about this is that because we're all kind of in the same boat, um, it normally lends itself to folks being extremely gracious with with each other so that's a good thing any questions on that or anything so far I've got a question <clears throat> one of the things that really discourages me from teaching uh, biblical information is I have a huge fear of teaching something inaccurate or misleading or somehow not uh, to the best of my abilities I look and search but mm -hmm. in that search there's this opinion and this opinion and this opinion and mm -hmm. then you try to figure out mm -hmm. what you think but what I think really doesn't matter because if I'm teaching and I'm held yeah. to a higher standard well, the, I want to make sure it's right yeah the, then what you do then is uh, you the, the level of the word and with, with with which you're mining, okay, start moving toward back toward the surface. Once you start moving back toward the surface, you'll find that uh, there will be truths within that passage that are not going to be uh, difficult to interpret or teach or to preach. I know you're looking at me like, yeah, that sounds very easy. I'm about, about to show you how. <laughs> I'm about to show you how that's done. Okay. Good. How do you go prevent uh, information overload? <clears throat> um, you have to think about the amount of time that you have, and then deal with when you're when you're dealing with everything because you know you have uh, like an introduction. I mean, if you break it again down, just like you do like our you know the papers we did in high school and college. You have your introduction, you have your three-point paragraph, and then you have your conclusion. So you just plug the data into that. And you may have a lot of data, and then you start stripping it away. Okay. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. <clears throat> With the teaching segment I've entitled, Do You Know God? Do You Know God? This verse is part of a verse out of the Lord's Prayer. It's a response to a question 
that the disciples ask Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus' response is this. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. This verse speaks magnitudes about who God is. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, how well do we know Him? There was a little boy who went to a military academy who was seven years old. <clears throat> Every Friday, the academy was faithful to have a parade where all the families would come and all the schoolboys would dress up in their military uniforms and they would go out onto the parade deck and march. All the parents would come except for this one little boy, Bill. Sergeant Major noticed that Bill's father very rarely came, yet Bill was faithful each Friday to be at the gate when all the parents would show up. One day, the Sergeant Major of the school went up to the little boy with tears in his eyes and said, Bill, why do you wait for the gate? Why do you wait for your father when your father so seldom comes? And Bill looked up at the Sergeant Major with tears in his eyes and said, because I don't know who my father is. And until I know who my father is, I don't know who I am. And that's the emphasis that what Jesus is trying to tell His disciples regarding God the Father. We have to know who God is. Because without that, we will not know our power, we will not know our purpose, we will not know our potential. The first thing that we need to notice about this verse is Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. He identifies God as Father. He presupposes, moreover, that God is real. God is real. To the atheist and the agnostics of this world who say there is no God, I say to them, then if there is no God, then tell the winds not to move. Tell the sun not to shine. Tell the seas to cease. They cannot. The truth is that they are the created. He is the Creator. They are finite. He is infinite. He is the God who measures the heavens with the span of His hand. He is the God that David says in Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Paul says in Romans 1, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, that is humankind, are without excuse. What Paul is saying is that no human being will ever stand before God on the judgment day and say, I didn't know any better, or I didn't know you existed. The word excuse there in that verse that Paul says in Romans 1.20 comes from a word apologia, which is where we get our English word apology. It means to provide a defense. And what Paul is saying is that no one has a defense for denying that God exists. They are all stand guilty for that. God is real. We even see that in the created world, Paul says. Consider a watch. If you were to uh, find a watch down on the beach, you wouldn't go down there with your friend and pick up the watch and say, hey, how did this watch get here? Someone had to drop it there. Why? Because the design and the intricacies of the watch, it's keeping perfect time. It has small mechanic uh, mechanisms in that watch that make it keep perfect time. It's something that you can touch. It's something that you can hear. It's something that's tangible. It's something that is created. Therefore, it presupposes there is a Creator. As such, the universe presupposes there is a Creator and God is real. Well, not only is God real, God is holy. We get that, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> what does holy mean? Holiness means to be set apart. It also means that God cannot sin. Sin cannot be in God's presence. God is totally and completely holy. 1 Peter 1.6, Peter writes, You shall be holy, because I, God speaking, am holy. 
We don't see holiness in our culture today. People lie all the time. Politicians change their mind. We always call that lying growing up. Now it's simply they just change their mind. People change. We're all changing. If you don't think you're changing, go home and take out a photograph of your wedding day when you were young and you were in your youth. And you wore a size 30 pants. Now I know for me, I get one leg in and can't figure out what to do with the other leg. Right? All the names in my phone belong to doctors rather than to my old friends because we're changing. The culture changes. Things that used to be considered sin in this country of ours are now something that has become the norm. When we were growing up in my generation and the generations that, that came before me, there was never any question about when a child was born, is this a boy or is this a girl? This is something that's now being debated in our culture today. The culture is changing. But God never changes. God is absolute. God is immutable. God is holy and His standard of holiness will never change. God is the total sum of moral purity. So not only then is God real, not only is God holy, but God also wants to know you. God also wants to know you. Notice what Jesus said, Our Father who is in heaven. There's a measure of relationship that is assumed in this verse. This is even expounded upon if we were to go over, but we won't do it for the sake of time, over into Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, where we find Paul in one long sentence in the Greek text. He's the master of run on sentences. But in one long sentence in the Greek text, talks to us about how God purposed and planned a. a, a uh, or counseled a plan that would include everyone who would ever come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from the penalty of their sin. That God the Father purposed this plan. That God the Son uh, secured this plan by coming to this world, by dying upon a cross, paying for the penalty of the sins of those who would come to place their faith and trust in Him, and that God the Holy Spirit would apply the redeeming merits of God the Son to those individuals so that all members of the Trinity are working. Why? Because God wants to know us. You see, we have no idea the value that heaven places on our soul. The value of your soul called Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, to come and be born in this world in a stinking manger with goats and pigs. The value of your soul caused Him to grow up as a poor person, someone who had to work, someone who was viewed as a Nazarene, someone who was from the other side of the tracks. The value of your soul caused him to be falsely accused and arrested, arrested before Rome, to be dragged before Pilate, to be beaten, to be whipped, to be mocked, to be scourged, to ultimately be placed on a cross. The value of your soul caused Him to endure not just the physical pain of the cross, but separation from the Father as He bore the wrath of God for our sins. That's the value that heaven places on your soul. That's the extent that God wants to know you. So what are some of the things that we can take away from this? God wants to know us. And He's provided a way for us to know Him through <coughs> prayer. This, after all, is a prayer. Jesus was telling the disciples, Pray then in this manner. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name. God speaks to us through His Word, but we speak to God through prayer. Secondly, applying His Word in life makes you more like Him. Applying His Word in life makes you more like Him. Why? Because you can't do what you don't know. Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of the mind. So that we have to take in the Word of God so that it becomes a part of us 
so that we can apply it so it therefore becomes lived out truth. So how do we do that? How do we apply these principles? First of all, start right now. Spend at least one hour every day this week studying Scripture. God wants to know you. How well do you want to know Him? Secondly, share your faith with at least one person this week. Share your faith with at least one person this week. Because God is using you as the means to spread the gospel. God wants to know you for sure, but God wants to know other people as well. So that they may know His love, His grace, His mercy. And by you sharing your faith, and you sharing your, the gospel, will allow people to come into a salvific relationship with Him. Consider what Jesus said over in John 14. In speaking to the disciples, He tells them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That is a statement of evangelism to be sure. But that is a statement that we as Christians are able to hang the essence of who we are on Him daily. And why do I say that? Because without the way there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. Let's pray. No, that's that's what you guys are doing. That's roughly 15 minutes right there. And the reason I did that for you uh, in that is because there's so much more that could be said, particularly about this one verse. Right? Some of the things in here that I alluded to are not mentioned specifically in the verse, but they bear on truths related to the verse. You follow what I'm saying? And I think that gets back to what you were talking about earlier. Uh, Jesus said, or no, uh, back to the, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Um, Jesus is not questioning whether God is real. He assumes that God is real, as we must assume that God is real. And so, that's not something specifically stated of what Jesus is trying to labor or argue, but it is, but it is a subset of the argument. Uh, particularly when you have people who, who may not be believers, uh, that's something that instead of getting into the intricacies of, of how God is in heaven, uh, and, and what does this mean? Because this is just but one verse and an entire prayer where He's talking about promise and he's talking about uh, provision and and he's talking about the problem of overcoming the evil one so it ties into a bigger segment but again taking just one thing here there are things that you can find in this verse that uh, connect with other truths that we find in scripture and that becomes your supporting like you have your point which would be Here, God is real, God is holy, God wants to know you. Those are things that as you go through, like make, making our observations, uh, when you say, okay, what is it about this verse? Well, Jesus is saying that God is, uh, that we're to pray to God. So the assumption is, is that there is a God there. There's someone to pray to. Secondly, that God is holy. When Jesus said, hallowed or holy is your name. <clears throat> and that God wants to know us based upon the relationship, our Father who art in heaven. But He's not everyone's Father. He's only the Father of those who believe. And there becomes the impetus for the uh, appeal to evangelism in your teaching segment or in your preaching if you have that opportunity. Okay. Does that help? Any, any questions on that? Do you guys kind of track with how I did that thing? And as far as illustrations go, um, that those illustrations that I used in there, uh, I, I heard that on the radio one time, and I just kind of wrote, jotted that down and put it away. The one at the end, without the way there is no going, without the truth there is no knowing, without the life there is no living. Uh, Ron Hint, who's the pastor of Calvary Chapel, 
down on the south side of town. When he first moved to Houston, he officed out of a little building, uh, and I got to know him when he first got on the radio. So I mean, I don't know if he's really accessible now because he's a pretty, pretty well-known guy. Um, but we would go down to Calvary Chapel and uh, got to talk to him, meet with him, and listen to him on the radio. And I heard him give that little quip one day, tying that back into the verse. I said, man, that sounds good. That sounds like something you could close with. And so you lock that away in the vault. But there's just so much, so much and many more things. Uh, and I would recommend, if you're going to be a, a good teacher, people can be a teacher, but if you want to be a good teacher, there's two things that you're going to have to make up and, and let become part of who you are. One, actually three things. One, you're going to be, have to be an avid reader. If you don't like reading, uh, <clears throat> it's probably not going to be, <laughs> uh, teaching is probably not going to be something you're going to be called to do because you have to keep abreast of everything that's going on in the culture that's written. Secondly, you have to be an avid observer of the culture, meaning you have to know what the current events are because you're constantly going to be drawing on those things. Just like the reference I made to the, the younger generation, how the culture is in reference to uh, societal mores and so on uh, in comparison to that which was different a generation ago or two generations ago. So you have to be a student of the culture as well. And then three, you have to constantly be taking in all the little quips, the, the illustrations and so on, because there's so many things. Illustrations are great uh, when, when they're not personal. I normally don't use them unless they're, they're things that really just reach out and grab me. I found that what normally works best are my own personal experiences, and you'll, you'll feel that way as well, because your personal experiences. You a, you're able to communicate those uh, much better than trying to memorize stories or jokes or what have you. But those three things are important. You have to be a voracious reader. All of the great pastors and preachers that came into our doctorate program that talked to us told us about how much they read. MacArthur and he's reading all the time. Albert Moeller, I think he reads like five or six books like every two or three days. Uh, he's, he's like one of those genius guys anyway, but he reads a lot. Steve Lawson reads a bunch of books. So you, you have to constantly be taking in data. Anything else? Or any questions? This, is, this may be more mechanical, but one of the things that I think is important is obviously the support of Scripture. And I watched as you did that mm -hmm. in this. Sometimes you'll have Scripture up here, and you were actually referring to Scripture that you had in your notes. Mm -hmm. what, how do you decide which ones, you know? Normally I would put them up there uh, if, if I wasn't quite sure... Um, I wasn't quite sure in this second segment how deep I was going to go. Uh, but I, w I knew I was going to have to have those supporting verses there. Okay. So I didn't want to like be flipping through the screen and confuse you um, or anything like that. But that, normally I would have those in there. Okay. Yeah. Most of the time if you're using PowerPoint, one of the benefits of PowerPoint, and I saw this uh, sun Sunday, this past Sunday, one of the benefits of PowerPoint, you know, boom, the, the verses are there. People right. are not having to do it. They're just looking up. Yeah. <clears throat> We went through Genesis 24, the entire chapter, which is 65 verses or 66 verses. Uh, don't do that as like uh, a beginning, or if you're not familiar with the with the, the group, uh, because a lot of times, if as a as an older teacher or one that's been with them, they'll let you get away with that. As a new guy doing that, yeah, they'll, you'll, you'll, that'll grade on them after a while. <laughs> so. Don't do it often in far as going into that much detail and reading. Because people's minds do begin to wonder. But that's a good question. Approximately how many slides did you just go through? <clears throat> now? Yes, it's a 20, 15 minute segment. Uh, about 20. 20. For the total of the course, there's 216 slides. 
So from the very first night up until tonight, it's been 216. By the way, uh, once we get done, I'm going to have all of these notes and this slide presentation. And if you guys um, would like, you can come to the Expositor's webpage, our Bible study webpage, under the file section. I, I, just about everything that I've done through like research papers, book reviews, teaching <laughs> lessons, uh, papers on practical ministry, theology, and so on, all my stuff is there. So you're, you're more than welcome to, to use whatever you guys want. Um, so if you just go to like Second Baptist and like the Expositors and then go to the Files page tonight or probably tomorrow, I'll load up all of our notes. And if it will allow me to load up this many slides, I'll put that up as well. So you, you guys will always have access to it along with the, well, I can't do the videos, but it's on my YouTube channel. So, yeah, anything else? You guys ready? I think you're going to do great. Like I said, just strip away the dross. No one's here. Uh, keep, keep everything. You know, don't be trying to, you know, mine down, you know, 500 miles. Stay close to the surface. You guys will be just, you know, I'm sure you'll do just fine. I mean, it takes a lot to be able to commit it to do this. Um, and so uh, I'm really encouraged by you guys sticking with it the whole time. I look forward to listening to your uh, presentation next week. Okay. That's assuming somebody's here. <laughs> nice. No, <that> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, don't, 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 don't cop out on me now. We're, we got one more week to go. We'll, we'll, you guys will be just fine. Uh -huh. Are we all giving presentation next week? Yeah. 15 minutes for all of us? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm planning on doing is depending upon how many that we have. If, and I'll, I'll give you guys the option, if you want to go a little bit past the hour, uh, if not, what I was planning on doing is having one of the, uh, the other pastors come and we'll split it to where like four will go with him into another room and then four will stay in here and then we'll do it that way. Well, if all of, all of us here shall uh, uh, 15 minutes, that's two hours right there. Mm -hmm. 30 and 30, that's 60 minutes. Yeah, but but you'll be. They have six, if we do two rooms. Yeah. Three. Oh, we're gonna do two rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, in other okay. words, there'll be in like a, a another. Uh, there'll be a, one of our pastors uh, or someone who will be proctoring like another class. Okay. And gotcha. then I'll be doing this. So yeah. No, we're not gonna be here two hours. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's what hey, here's the thing. I learned my mistake from teaching the class last time mm -hmm. because there was more people in there, and what this is what I noticed. Uh, I say, okay, well, the next two weeks we're gonna be doing the teaching segment. So you get you four guys, y'all are going to go next week. And so everybody was here to get to critiques. But then on the second week, guess what? <laughs> these four guys didn't show up, and it was these four guys. So I figured the best way to do it is just have everybody do it in one night. So, But, yeah, we'll have we'll have someone here to, to help accommodate that. So yeah, good can I, can I get the empty room? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you guys will do great. All right, let's pray.